Hey guys, welcome to Stonegate Online. Thank you so much for joining us today to enjoy Jesus together. Yes. And uh, so my name is Tony Robinson, and I'm here on staff. My name is Lindsay Schott. I'm on here on staff. Yes, and so we're so thankful again that you'd come and join with us. And while our building is still closed. Closed. We are opening. We are opening. July 12th, baby. It's happening. Yes. So July 12th, that's in four weeks. Yep. Isn't that wild? I can't believe it. It's kind of wild that it's June. Yes. In four weeks, like in pandemic days, that's like, that's nothing. That's, that's nothing. It's going to be here before, before you know it. That's right. uh, so, but until then, we still would love for you to engage with us, you know, online via Facebook, Instagram, again, mm -hmm. no TikTok, but all of those would be great. <laughs> and then also, if you're just kind of working through as you're listening to the sermon or even just like worshiping the Lord and the Lord's mm -hmm. just kind of just impressing on you, yeah. respond, man, mm -hmm. we would love to engage with you on that. So what can we do for those people? What can they do? They can text 97,000 and talk about any prayer request you might have, something you want to pray with with people, you will get a response. We would love to be praying and worshiping with you. Yeah, that'd be great. And, uh, you know, and actually thinking of like July 12th. Yes. That's happening. That'll be a baptism Sunday. That's going to be a baptism Sunday. We're going to like do it big on the first one that's and right. uh, just celebrate one, just God's faithfulness yeah. uh, to our church, but also that he's still in the business of saving people. Always. Come on now. And so that'll just be Always. a great, great moment for people for us to just celebrate that mm -hmm. God is a God that's faithful to his church, to his people, um, and he is giving grace. And so man, if you're thinking, I would like to mm -hmm. just take that step of obedience um, once I've been saved and just mm -hmm. kind of declare that good news mm -hmm. uh, to people um, and share your story, uh, that you can register actually mm -hmm. online. Yep. And you don't ha have to actually go just on your computer or laptop yes. to do that. You can actually do what, Lindsay? You can get on the Church Center app. Church Center app, people. So all you have to do is mm -hmm. go onto your phone, Church Center app, and it has all of the things that you can register for. So that includes uh, baptism, mm -hmm. uh, and that also includes what's coming up in actually a couple days, yes. our blood drive. Our blood drive. Yeah. So June 16th. June 16th, couple days. And so that's the whole idea of give blood, give life. Mm -hmm. That'd be a great way to just serve our, our church community, and mm -hmm. there's just... With, with pan the pandemic that's happened, yeah. there hasn't been a lot of blood just for people to kind of right. have, uh, like for hospitals to have, right. to give to people that need that. So right. yes, June 16th. And then we also have, not sure if you, like if you heard this last week, Well Week. Well Week is happening. Well Week is happening, people. So that's for our student ministry. They're mm -hmm. going to the beach. Yes, they are. They're crazy, oh. but they're doing it. <laughs> so they're getting on buses and they're going all the way to the other side of That's the United right. States. And they're going to worship it. the Lord for a week. So you can actually go online, actually to the Church Center app and sign up yes. for that as well. So all that's happening, Yes. which is crazy. And so we actually now just have finished last week mm -hmm. our James series. Mm -hmm. And we're jumping into kind of some standalones. Yep. And so today, uh, we're actually going to have Ryan Kearns uh, yes. join us uh, to, to give the message and talking about just kind of this uh, balance mm -hmm. of like faith and fear. Yes. And faith needs to be up here. Yeah. Faith down here. And so, I mean, I, I know that just through this whole pandemic, there's been questions about mm -hmm. like, what does that look like? And how, like, is, is us closing our building? Is that being faithless? And mm -hmm. how do we walk, you know, uh, by faith and yeah. we're just in a pandemic or out of a pandemic. And yeah. so I'm actually really excited to see Me too. Uh, what Ryan has to say, and I, I'm sure it'll be just a treat for us. So that's happening. And before the message, we'll have our worship team come out and uh, lead us in a couple songs. And kiddos, join in with us on that. Yes. Praise the Lord. You don't have, I don't know if you had donuts this morning or not, but like you can actually join in and have this be a family moment where you're worshiping Jesus together. So we hope that you can do that. And uh, visitors, for those of you that are online and joining with us for the first time, we're so thankful that you're joining with us and we hope that you have a great service. Thanks, guys. Well, hey there, Stonegate Church. My name is Jimmy. I'm one of the pastors here at the church and we're so glad that you joined us uh, today. Man, we miss you guys. I miss, I miss humans. You guys miss humans? I miss humans. There, okay, great. Uh, so thanks for uh, jumping in with us today. We are uh, here as close as we can be with you in this season to celebrate King Jesus. And so we're going to worship him right now, and we want you to join us. And we are uh, going to do that starting with a responsive reading, something that we want to be true of our church family every week to week. So my part will be on the screen, and then uh, your part, and then we'll sing songs to the Savior. It goes like this. To all who are weary and needy of rest to all who feel alone and want community, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, 
to all who fail and desire strength, to all who worry and want peace, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and to whoever will come, say with us, this church offers her welcome. Let's worship him. Thank you. 
desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Oh Jesus Christ my Lord Sing this out. The name of so great a mercy. What a heart could find such boundless grace. The God, the God of ages, stepped down from glory. What did he do? To wear my sin and bear The cross. The cross has hope, I am forgiven, the King of Kings. Beautiful, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus, oh Jesus Christ, my living. Praise the Lord who saved me free. Hallelujah. Dead and lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living oh, oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Death has lost it. You're broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Oh, my living hope, my living hope, my only hope.
pray with me? You are our living hope, God. When it feels like life has its hand around our neck, we remember that we have a hope, a hope that doesn't disappoint. And God, would you produce in this season a hope like that in us as we persevere, as we persevere in the midst of question marks, in the midst of suffering and difficulty, uh, in the midst of just all the uncertainty that comes with living inside a pandemic or just the circumstances in our life right now, God, would you help us to persevere in a way that produces hope in us? Hope that we're yours because we're persevering, that, that you really have changed us. Hope that we are really anchored to you. Uh, hope that has eyes to see the, the glorious future that you have for us, that bright future you have for us. Hope that, that takes all of our suffering in this life and all of the difficulty and says about it that this is going to feel light and momentary in light of the eternal weight of glory coming for us. Would you give us that kind of hope? That's Christian hope. That's, that's hope only the saints get. So God, produce that kind of hope in us. Lord, we love you. We're eager to hear from you today. We want to know you today. Change us through your word as you are always eager to do by the power of your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' good name we ask. Amen. Good morning, Stonegate. I'm going to be reading through a passage in Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 14. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is it not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. This is God's word. I want to start off our time today with a question. A question that I think has been on the minds of many of us over the last couple months. The question is, what are we going to do now? We, what are we going to do now? What are we as, as the people of God? What are we going to do as Christians? What are we going to do as the Stonegate family now? Uh, the last couple months have been filled with all sorts of chaos and change in our country, in our communities, and in our lives. And so the question every single one of us asks as the coronavirus takes shape and the, uh, evolves and changes all around us, as we watch the news on a nightly basis right now and we feel like there's more chaos than ever before, schools are closing, racial tensions are being exposed, and social unrest is mounting. We see financial markets rocked and we feel that sense of angst and fear all around us. And the question becomes, what are, what are we going to do now? Over the last couple months, Americans have responded in all sorts of different ways. For some folks, it has been the hoarding of toilet paper. We have run to the grocery store and we've stockpiled our pantries as full as we can in a moment possibly driven by fear, or we've bought enough Pure Rail to bathe in. But it's been a question of what are we going to do now? If we're honest, it's a, it's a scary moment for a lot of people. It's a fear-filled time in our society. We don't know what tomorrow will hold. None of us know what tomorrow will hold. And in some ways, that amplifies the fear inside of every one of us, let alone even the next six months or the rest of 2020. And 2020, friends, I don't know if you feel it, but I feel it, has just been tough. And we still have six more months to go. So church, what, what are we going to do now? As we think about what it means to be followers of Jesus in this particular moment in time, what would the Lord want us to do? He is, our, he is our God who cares for us, who loves us. So what would he want? What would bring glory to our God right now in this moment for us to do? 
And I don't know if we can exhaustively answer that question, but one real basic question that we can wrestle with even today is this question. The question for you and me, very practically speaking, the question for you and me, theologically speaking, as we, we, we seek to be followers of Jesus, are we going to live by fear or are we going to live by faith? Uh, over the last couple months, it has been so providential that we've been in the book of James and just looking at how much faith works. And this is just another moment for us today to continue into that reality of looking how our faith works inside of our fear, inside of moments filled with fear, inside of circumstances filled with fear. And fear is a, it's a natural inclination to a lot of things that are going on around us. I don't want for a minute to even deny that we live in a world that gives us plenty to be fearful of. And fear is natural when we think about things that are unknown, when you and I can't see the future, when we don't know what is over the horizon, when we don't know where our next paycheck is going to come from or what economically is in store for us or what's going to happen inside of our cultural pressures and frustrations. You and I, we often fear what we cannot understand, which has been a source for many generations inside of our culture, culture particularly often of prejudice and bias. And we also fear what we cannot see. As much as we like to think we've grown up, there's still so much inside of me and you that's like the little kid going to bed, fearful of what is in the dark. But what's interestingly, uh, uh, for all of us who are followers of Christian to consider, what's interesting enough is that faith is also des uh, defined by what we cannot see. In fact, the Bible defines faith this way. In Hebrews 11, it says the substance of things hoped for. It's, it's what we're hoping for. It's where we put our hope. Even in spite of circumstances, it's still where we put our hope. It says the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So you and I, we, we don't always live by sight, but rather as Christians, we are called to live by faith. And do you know that, that, that the call to not be afraid is the most repeated commandment in all of Scripture, not one of the Ten Commandments, not even to, to love God and love your neighbor, although those are, are the greatest commandments, but rather the most common commandment in all of Scripture is to fear not. It's to not be afraid. It's to, to, to walk with a sense of boldness because of not of your strength, but rather because of the one whose strength is with you. And this fear not is often the first word of angels that they speak into moments where they show up. And into these circumstances, there's often plenty to be afraid of. It's the first word spoken in the New Testament when angels arrive. And they also, it's the last words that Jesus shares with his disciples in the upper room as he commissions them into this reality that you and I find ourselves in right now, which is to go into the world seeking the peace and the shalom of the world around us, the flourishing of the world around us in every way by sharing the good news of the gospel, but then seeing the implications of the gospel lived out and demonstrated until all of God's people find rest under his rule and reign. But often these, these moments where, where fear not is the command come in very hopeless moments. They come in very fear-filled moments. And that's often the paradox. So what are you and I going to do now when there's plenty to fear and yet we are told by our God to live not in fear and to do not be afraid, but rather to live by faith? I want to unpack with you a story that many of you are probably familiar with from Exodus 14. Even if you haven't read it, if you're not a Bible person, you've probably come across it even in a movie at some point. And this is that famous scene of the Israelites who had to wrestle with that question, that very real practical question in front of them. Were they going to live by fear or were they going to live by faith? And so here's our scene starting in Exodus chapter 14, verses 10. Let me just paint it for you a little bit. There's, there's, a, there's a Red Sea in front of the Israelites. There's a huge body of water in front of them. And the Israelites have just finally made their way out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, 400 years of bondage, 400 years of oppression and waiting for God to come. And it's just only been days, think about it, only it's been days since they've seen God show up in miracle after miracle. 
God, he, he performs these 10 plagues, and the last one being, being the greatest, where the death angel passes over the homes of the Israelites, sparing their firstborn sons. And Pharaoh finally relinquishes and frees the Israelites, but his heart is hardened, and he quickly goes after them to once again enslave them. So Pharaoh releases them after centuries of oppression, but now the Egyptian army is coming after in full force to recapture the Israelites. And imagine if you're the Israelites, imagine if you're there with them in that moment on the banks of the Red Sea and you have the world's most powerful army in hot pursuit and you have a large body of water in front of you, you literally feel trapped. You feel stuck. You are filled with fear. You would hear the hoofbeats of the horses. You'd hear the roar of the chariots. You would see a cloud of dust and you would know you were in trouble. So here's what it says, starting in verse 10. It says, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Notice that they're, they're afraid. Of course they are. If you're in that situation, you would be afraid too. But now here, their fear turns into sarcasm with Moses. Here's what they say in verse 11. They said to Moses, Is it because... There are not graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to bring us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. And notice already what's going through their minds. They've gone from fear, they, they move into sarcasm, and they finally end with worst case scenarios. It's this terrible merry-go-round of what happens to us when we feel gripped by fear around us. Now, I don't want to pile on too hard with the Israelites because fear is a natural human response. I mean, a lot of us have felt that in very real ways over the last couple months when your back is against the wall. And if you're taking notes today, I want you to just identify this cycle, this fear-filled cycle that the Israelites are living out and that you and I often find ourselves living out as well. First, they are, they're full of fear. Fear has set in. There's a real thing for them to be afraid of. Number two, they, they get sarcastic with their leader, Moses. Um, they, they turn to sarcasm and, and the twin brother of sarcasm, which is cynicism, and they let that loose on Moses. And we'll look at that more here in a second. And lastly, they start imagining worst case scenarios. And you know, I've been there many times in my life. I've been in spots where my back has felt like it's been up against the wall. I've had circumstances. I've had marriage realities and moments. I've had moments inside of my family and even moments as a pastor where I've just felt under fear, where I've felt stressed. And you and I all know what it's like to be in a fear-filled moment. You get afraid. And when you're scared, there's that fight or flight instinct that kicks in. And what do you do? You and me, we go into that sarcasm mode because sarcasm in some ways, it's, 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 it's a way for us to cope. It's a way for us to deal with our disappointment. You know, it, it often shows up in phrases like, well, can you believe what they did? I wouldn't have made that decision. What is my boss even thinking? I can't believe they would even think that would work out. When will our politicians and our leaders ever get it together if they only knew half of what I know, and this victim mentality gets going and cynicism kicks in. And before you know it, you're off to the races and jumping into the absolute worst case scenarios. You imagine everything absolutely falling to pieces. And here you are. It's this terrible, vicious cycle of living in fear, afraid, uh, sarcasm, and then living in all of your worst case scenarios, and you repeat that over and over, fear, sarcasm, worst case scenarios, fear, sarcasm, worst case scenarios. Let's talk about each of those for a quick second as we look at the Israelites' situation and mine and yours inside of that. Our text says, once again in verse 10, it says, the Israelites were, were, were terrified. They were filled with fear. This was, a, this was not just like you know what, uh, I'm not sure if, 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 they've, if they've sold out of, of my favorite ice cream at Kroger right now, and I, I'm anxious to get there and find out, but this is a real fear. This is a legitimate fear. This is beyond toilet paper inside a coronavirus fear. This is a legitimate fear. And let me ask you, have you been in that spot? And when you're in that spot of fear, do you make better or worse decisions when you're terrified? When you're scared, have you found yourself making better or worse decisions? 
You know, uh, a few years ago, I, I lived in Colorado, and I had a friend one time who was climbing up in the mountains, and he came across a mountain lion. And fortunate enough for him, he'd had some training in the outdoors, and he remembered some of the guidance he was given in that moment if you were to encounter a mountain lion. And number one is, is, is to stay calm. And to think about that, he, he comes face to face with a mountain lion who's sizing him up, who he could feel like was stalking him, and he has to, to stay calm. When everything inside you wants to flee or fight, he has to stay calm. He has to, he has to wait. And sometimes when we react quickly, when we panic, when we overreact, it clouds our thinking. It makes the situation much worse. Fear is hardly ever the place where you and I make our best decisions. And I'm not saying that fear is never understandable. In fact, I think there are moments where it's very natural for us to be afraid, but fear should never be our final destination. Just like a rest stop on a highway, fear is never meant to be a place where you make your home. You're meant to pass on through, hopefully, and get to a place of faith and trust and safety and security. Because here's the problem, friends, with fear. Fear always sneers at the idea of hope. And Jesus' people, you and I, are called to be hope-filled people, to live by hope, even in spite of circumstances at times. You and I are to live by hope because we know there is a hope of glory, that regardless of momentary circumstances, there is an eternal circumstance that allows us to pull into hope, even into dark moments that we might be living in. But fear often sees hope as silly, it sees it as childish. Fear pollutes our thinking. It sees hope as an unnecessary luxury. How about sarcasm? Do any of you struggle with that? I should probably raise my hand a little bit. I, I know that's a temptation for me. Sarcasm is, is the next step in this cycle of stepping into the fear-filled plan. And just listen to the Israelites' sarcasm with Moses. I mean, this is, it's, it's got some comedy even built into it a little bit. Here's what it says in Exodus 14, verse 11. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? I mean, did you catch that? Did, did you catch what they're basically saying? They're saying, were, were they out of cemetery plots in Egypt? Is it just cheaper funerals out here by the Red Sea? Is, is that what's going on? Now, let me just ask you for a second. Is, is that constructive? Do you think that's adding or helping the situation that they find themselves in? Often, another thing that our, our fear does is it pushes us into sarcasm and cynicism is those places are often much more destructive than they are constructive, that we lose the ability to, to see clearly and to, to find ourselves as hope-filled people who can look at a situation and, and find a solution or to put our hope and trust in God even when it seems like all else will fail. And then they throw in this line, I love in verse 12, they say, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptian. Moses, weren't we begging you to leave us in Egypt? We had such good careers and promising futures and 401ks and strong economies. It was so great. And, and Moses just had to be looking at him like, what? No, that's, that's not true at all. That's not at all what was going on. You were begging God. You had been begging God for hundreds of years to deliver you out of Egypt. But how quickly they forget. And friends, you and I are a lot like the Israelites. It is so easy for us to get. And what sarcasm does is it robs us of what we know to be true. It distorts our thinking and it, and it robs us of our memory, our memory of how God has come through for us, how God has shown up for us in the past. And we think that God is all done with us. We think that God won't come through again for us. And so sarcasm actually has them in a place where they're lying and they're reckless with their language and they're playing the blame game. They're looking at Moses and they're doing revisionist history. But most of all, they're forgetting about who they belong to and who their God is. Friends, they have lost the focus and the ability to see clearly who God is. Now, I know a lot of us, we've probably seen this in, in many places show up inside our lives. I mean, sarcasm, when we feel like a relationship is beyond repair, when we feel like an issue in our culture is never going to be fixed, we find ourselves just going negative. We find ourselves throwing in the towel and saying, this feels hopeless. Why even bother? Why even try? And outside of the, the grace of God, outside of the strength of God, outside of the love of God, outside of the hope that God offers you and me, that's actually true. There is no reason. There is no hope. 
But friends, that is not the posture or the belief or the stance of the Christian, of the person who is in Jesus Christ. I've been in ministry for nearly two decades now, and I'll just say this. I've seen church situation after church situation where people get sarcastic with one another, where church leaders maybe make a decision that people didn't like, or you're in a home group and something goes south, or you guys don't agree on direction or even focus, and it just goes sideways with sarcasm and cynicism. One of my favorite things about our church family, Stonegate, is our deep, committed value to, to stay at the table, that there will be cruddy valley moments. And that is we walk inside of not just our church community, but we figure out how to be Christians together inside of this culture. We stay as one. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus prayed for you and me, that we would stay united and uh, that our unity, that our unity would be a testament to the watching world of the hope and the love of the God that we serve. And last, let me talk about worst case scenarios a little bit. And this is one of those mindsets, if you think about it, where some of us are just, we are professional catastrophizers. We've turned it into an art form. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's someone you live with. Maybe you can just kind of nudge them right now on the couch. And we've turned it into an art form. We have become amazing at mulling around something that's a small little pebble and turning it into a boulder. We can already think 15 steps down the road and how nothing's going to work out. I almost think about this as channeling your inner Eeyore. Like before you know it, you are sitting there and you are just thinking about how the sky is falling and it's going to go terrible and it could never get better and woe is me. Why did I get out of bed? And, and, and just think about that. Where has that ever led when you've laid your head down on your pillow and you've thought about the worst case scenarios, when you've thought about even the next six months or what it will look like for, for us to step out of a pandemic or what it will look like for us even to, to, to get through the rest of 2020? And do you let your mind run wild with worst case scenarios? And if you do, friends, where is hope? Where is Jesus? Where is the gospel in those moments? Is there space for them to actually show up and play inside of your spirit? And we're going to talk about that in just one second here. Uh, but the Israelites aren't done. In fact, in verse 12, they go on and they says, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. You almost have to think how much they really are just thinking of worst case scenarios. They've got the Egyptian army coming after them. They're seeing a giant sea in front of them and they feel like, just send us back into slavery. It's better than this death that we're surely gonna face. But what's interesting is no one's actually died yet. Have you noticed that? No deaths have occurred. But in the Israelites' mind, they've gone to worst case scenario that surely we are going to die. And this is astounding, isn't it? I mean, days, just days ago, they watched God do the miraculous. They watched God defeat the most powerful man in the world. And they've already saw, said to themselves, their hearts have already vacuumed out any hope that God would come through for them again. Gosh, I am so like the Israelites. There's so much of that in me. The author of Aesop's Fables, he once said this, and it's such a great quote. He said, my life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. Friends, you and I, we can find ourselves catastrophizing and going through worst case scenarios in ways that are altogether super unhelpful and don't lead us toward faith, but rather lead us deeper into fear. Jesus makes this same point in Matthew 6, 20 says, he says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Jesus is bringing reason to the table. He's saying, think about it for a second. If you realize just how little control you have over life, that actually frees you to think your worry is not going to actually add any more strength, any more power, or any more control to your reality. In fact, worrying doesn't solve your problems. All it does is it smuggles tomorrow's problems into today. And Jesus says, don't do, don't do that. Don't burglarize the problems of tomorrow to sneak them into today. Rather, they belong in tomorrow. There's enough trouble for tomorrow. And when you take tomorrow's troubles and pull it into today, what you're saying is, God, I don't think you care, and I don't think you'll show up. And most of our worry, friends, most of our worry is just us praying to ourselves. It's prayer to ourselves. It's saying, God, rather than relying on you, and our our worry really should, our fear should drive us to our knees and praying to the one who can control, the one who is mighty to save. And that's the invitation, that's the encouragement that Jesus is giving us even there in Matthew chapter 6. 
So here they are. Here's the cycle of fear. They, they go from, we, we are filled with fear, we're afraid, then they get sarcastic, and then they go into worst case scenario. And before you know it, pandemonium has broken out, and all of them, think about it, two million people at the bank of the Red Sea basically just going, we're all going to die. We're hopeless. We're all going to die. And at that moment, Moses has one of the most incredible moments in all of Scripture. Moses puts on a clinic in leadership and a faith that works. And that's what I want us to look at. He stands up and he says, time out, everybody. Pause. We need a better plan. We need a better plan. Rather than this fear-filled plan, we need a better plan. And the plan that Moses wants to bring to the table, he wants to bring a, a faith in a really big God plan, a, faith, a plan that is, is big enough to save, a plan that actually push, pu- pushes us toward faith rather than to fear. And here's what he says in verse 13. He says, fear not. Fear not. So he's making that same command, that most common, regular, um, repeated command in all of Scripture. And then he says, stand firm, and you will see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work out today. So this is the plan that Moses gives us, and I'll go quickly through it. He says, first, we are are going to adopt a a fear not mentality. And yes, it really is possible, friends, to, to move into that place, not by our own power, but rather by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and who controls all of the universe. So he says, we're going to start with developing a fear not mentality. And then number two, we're going to stand firm. We're going to stand firm. That's what Moses is saying. I know the the Egyptians are coming. I know the Red Sea is in front of us, but we will stand firm. And once again, not on our own strength, but rather on the God who's delivered us out of Egypt and will continue to deliver us because he is mighty to save. And then he says, finally, we're going to expect, we're going to eagerly expect God's help. We're not going to believe that God's abandoned us. We're not going to believe that God's done with us. That's the new plan. That's what we're going to do. And friends, I just want to tell you, this is a much better plan. This faith working in a big God plan is much better than the fear-filled plan that so naturally engulfs us. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to, to fear not, to not be afraid. And I know some of you are even thinking, is, is that even possible? Is it even possible to not freak out? And I believe it is. I believe it's possible to tame the wild and often irrational and fear-filled thoughts that flood our mind and our soul. Uh, those, those thoughts, once again, where we catastrophize and we go worst case scenario and we look around, but we will not actually do that of our own strength and of our own accord. And this isn't self-help. There isn't no magic mantra you can say that makes it all better. But what makes it possible. What really makes this a reality for you and me who are in Christ is it's because of the Spirit who lives in us. Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Here's what he says, Paul saying to Timothy, his young disciple. He says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear. He's speaking about the spirit that God's given to you and me, saying God didn't give us a spirit of freaking out, but rather he gave us a spirit of love and power and self-discipline. Did you catch that? He's saying this this spirit, this spirit that came to take up residence in you, the spirit that's come to take up residence inside of me. God, who used to dwell with the Israelites in a tabernacle and then a temple, now dwells because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. And then Jesus ascends and there's Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is delivered as 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 a, a down payment gift to all of God's people and takes up residence in our heart and makes us a new creation in Christ that you and I are now empowered to no longer live by fear, but rather by faith. And part of this living by faith is that you and I are able to live with a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-discipline. How does that practically work out? Well, one helpful thing I've noticed in my life over the years, and this is just a way of, I've found to, to preach the gospel to myself, and, and a lot of it is just rooted in what Jesus identifies in Matthew 6, where he, he once again is speaking about fear and anxiety. And what he does is he, he, he speaks to his audience and he says, hey, just consider the lilies, consider the flowers around you. Think about the, 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 the world around you and how God clothes it and God provides for it. And if he does that, wouldn't he surely do that much and more for you? And what Jesus is doing in that moment is he's saying, when you find yourself freaked out, when you find yourself going down the fear-filled cycle, would you, would you stop and would you just meditate and consider and look around at the character of the God who has already saved you? 
this almighty God, this beautiful God, this compassionate God, this fathering God, this holy God, this God that is near, this God that has been compassionate and caring to you and met you in all of your most broken places. Would you look at his track record, all the ways that he's continued to make the sun come up and the rain fall down and the the plants grow and the world around you flourish so that you would be cared for. He's saying, remind yourself of God's track record. So for me, over time, I've, just, I've done this in a journal. I'll just get out and I'll write down my most overwhelming thoughts. And friend, if you struggle with anxiety, this is such a great practice for you. Get a prayer journal and write out your places of anxiety. Write out those worst case scenarios. Write out those catastrophizing thoughts that you have. Write out those freak out moments and then write down promises from God. Remind yourself of how good God is. This good news, the good news of the character and the nature and the work of Jesus is exactly what your fearful heart needs and my fearful heart needs and that the Holy Spirit uses so that you, can I, you and I can live with a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. And Moses makes clear to the people as they are standing at the Red Sea that what they need to do more than anything else isn't necessarily get busy with activity and flurry, but rather it is to stand firm. And then he says in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. And so see, although it seems like the battle is raging all around in their circumstances and obviously a very fear-filled situation, the real battle is inside their hearts for supremacy of what they think is most powerful and important and weighty. And Moses is inviting the people of Israel in to remember, to be reminded of who God is and what God has done for them. It has echoes of Psalm 46, where we are told to be still and know that God is God. And so even when circumstances are crashing all around, that our God is a fortress And then often what we do to testify to a watching world, just what it looks like to live by faith, to be people of faith, is that we stand firm. Even when we don't see into the future, even when there is plenty to be afraid of, we still choose to stand firm. And standing firm, friends, is not passive. In fact, it's incredibly active. It's us doing work inside of our hearts, saying we want faith that works against our fear. And and many of us, we can look around right now and we can look at our national and we can look at our global circumstances right now and we can wonder where it is all going. We can look at economic pressures. We can look at racial divisions. We can look at upcoming elections. We can look at health pandemics and we can wonder what is about to happen. And so church, I even have legitimate fears in this moment. I worry about those things as well. And the Lord is beckoning me. He's been beckoning me all week to stand firm. It's time for you and I to stand firm in not our strength, but rather the strength of God, the one who is mighty to say, and it says, be silent and the Lord will fight for you. We don't have to fight for ourselves, but rather our God will fight on our behalf. And as we do, as we we surrender to his strength and to his will, you and I testify to a watching world what it looks like to live by faith rather than to live by fear. And the last part of Moses' big God plan is is this eager expectation for God to help. He has almost this, this giddy excitement. You can see that he is eager. He believes that God is going to come through. Not like God might. God, I don't really want to pray that hard because what if you don't do anything? It's going to be really embarrassing. Two million people are watching. He doesn't have that posture at all, but rather he's anticipating. He believes that God will deliver them. There's so much hope and anticipation in Moses. And friends, here's the question. Here's the question of the day. Here's the, actually, I should say statement of the day. What you really believe about God is revealed when you're afraid. What you really believe when you are afraid, what you really believe about God is revealed. That God, are you absent do we turn into functional atheists that, God, I don't really think that you, you matter. I don't think that, or maybe just, maybe deists. God, you're out there, but I don't think you're near. I don't think you care. I don't know if you're going to hear me. I don't know if you're going to show up. So what do we really believe about God when the pressure's on, when our back is up against the wall, when we feel stuck, when we've lost our job, when it feels like society all around us is giving way? 
What are we going to do? What are we going to do when there's nothing we can do? Will we expect God to help? See, friends, sometimes the very best thing that you and I can do is we can fall to our knees and say, God, I know you are with me. God, I know you are for me. God, I know you will never let me go. God, I see your track record. I see how you have been faithful to your sons and daughters throughout all of biblical history when they've been in a jam. And look at your own life. Look at your own story, how God has shown up and he's been faithful to you time and time again. And repeat the promises of God and his character and his nature and how mighty he is to save. And friends, I'm just gonna say it. You should be so bold as to believe and expect that God will help you. Just like Moses did in the most difficult situation you could imagine. He's expecting God to help. So once again, you're seeing that the Israelites, they're trapped with their backs against the red wall and the rapidly approaching, or Red Sea, I should say, and the rapidly approaching army of Egypt is coming at them and they're afraid. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this. I found this really interesting this week as I was studying this passage. God never tells them that he's going to part the Red Sea. He doesn't give them a heads up. He doesn't actually take away their fear by letting them know what's going to happen next. In fact, all he does is God tells them to just stand firm through Moses, to stand firm. Now, here's the tricky thing in this, friends. God's word is very clear that God tends to wait for our declaration of faith. He tends to wait for our conviction, for our statement, for our rootedness in our heart that we're going to stand firm often before he supernaturally intervenes. As Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, faith is a lot like a staircase where you can only see the first step. And that's because God is growing us to be people who walk and live by faith, that we trust him, that we know his heart and we know his character. And Moses decides to boldly lead the people in being people who walk by faith rather than people who live by fear. And he says, I'm expecting God to deliver us today. In verse 15 of, of, of chapter 14 of Exodus, here's what he says. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I love that. I love how he just kind of says, there's been enough talk. Quit talking about it. Tell them to start moving forward. And that had to be such an interesting moment because here's the Red Sea and here's the Egyptian army behind us and he just tells you to move on. He's telling them, take that first step. Take that, take that step into faith and you will watch me move. No more worst case scenarios. No more sarcasm. Time to walk by faith. This is a faith that works, friends. This is a faith that is firm and rooted in knowing who God is and that our God is mighty to say. So what do they do? They step out. And they step out to find out. They step out to find out that their God is a good God, a loving God, and a God who keeps his promises. And as they step into the not water, not knowing what God will do, they still don't know what God will do. God does one of the most breathtaking miracles of all time. He creates a wind, a mighty wind. Imagine that wind. I can only imagine what that wind was like. Exodus 15 verse 8 says this, it was a blast of God's nostrils. Think about that. God breathes down from his nose and he, he parts the Red Sea. He provides a way of deliverance for the people of Israel. And two million Israelites begin to walk through to their place of salvation, that their God has delivered them once again from their fear, from this place of feeling like this predicament has no safe outcome. But God, notice this, this is incredible for my story and for you. God didn't take the Israelites around the Red Sea. God didn't build a bridge over the Red Sea. God didn't tunnel underneath the Red Sea. God didn't give them a jet ski to go over the Red Sea, but rather God took them through the Red Sea. He took them through the challenge. He took them through the obstacle. He took them through the very thing, but they did it by trusting and relying and having faith in the goodness and character of God. Imagine what a faith fortifying, a faith growing moment that had to be for the Israelites. You're walking through these massive walls of water on each side of you, what that would have been like. Maybe the worship songs you would have been singing as you're walking through walls of water on each side of you and you're getting to sing and praise God for once again showing up and delivering you. You're watching God move. What a great God they had. What a great God we have, friends. 
And I don't know about you, but I, I love the rest of the story as the Egyptian army then races into the, the, the Red Sea to follow behind the Israelites and the Israelites make their way out onto the other si- side. Those, those, those walls come crashing down and vanquish the enemy of God's people. And they have the biggest party you could ever imagine. And they celebrate and they testify to the goodness of God. And Moses just looks and says, this is what it looks like for us to live by faith rather than fear. This was the fear not, stand firm, expect God to help plan. This was the plan that Moses said, when we have our back up against the wall, when you and I, as followers, as kids of Jesus, that we would have this kind of plan, that we would live by faith rather than living by fear. What do you think this did for the faith of the Israelites? They had just experienced so many miracles. Think about the Israelites. They had just experienced the Passover miracle. They had experienced the the miracle of their first sons being um, spared from the angel of death. They had experienced the miracle of watching the Red Sea part. Then just a couple days later, they would experience the miracle of manna coming from heaven. And then days or years after that, they would experience the miracle of water coming from a rock. Why was God doing all of these miracles? Why was he putting them in a place of dependency over and over and over again? Because he wanted them to live by faith. He wants you and I to live by faith. So friends, I'm just standing before you today and I'm begging with you. I'm pleading with you. I'm saying, if we are going to be Bible people, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be Jesus loving people, a big Jesus, a big God who's sovereign over everything, would you join me? Would you join me in just saying, let's not be sarcastic people. Let's not be fear-filled people. Let's not be worst-case scenario people, but rather let's be people that believe in the bigness and the goodness of God. See, because this really is all about what is the the battle going on inside your heart and my heart, because that's the true Exodus story. That's the story where Jesus shows up to defeat your Pharaoh, your enemies, the enemies of Satan and sin and death. And he walks you across your Red Sea, which was the waters of baptism as you enter into deliverance by God's mighty hand and power. And then he vanquishes your enemies as they try to come behind you and swallow up your life. But you've been kept by God. You've been loved by God. Jesus has you secure in his very grip. And friends, if you haven't been baptized, we actually have a baptism service coming up in a few weeks. And this would be a great moment for you to take that step into being baptized. It is a great reminder for all of us who are in Christ that our God is mighty to say that he does deliver, that we can fear not, we can stand firm, and we can expect God's help. So Stonegate, let me close with saying this. Let me just ask you this. What kind of church are we going to be? What are we going to do right now? Are we going to shrink back? Are we going to run and hide? Are we going to look at the world around us and feel hopeless? Are we going to channel you know, that Eeyore spirit and think worst case scenarios and think that, that our best days are behind us or that God has abandoned us? Are we going to live with a sense of excitement and anticipation and hope and love and power and, and grace toward the world around us. The world needs us more than ever, church. He needs Christians that live with this faith-filled mindset. And last thing, I just want to say this. I, I want nothing more than all of us, us as a church community, than you and your families out there. I want you to have these kind of faith-filled stories over the years that you would have moments where you would just be able to sit down at your dinner table with your family and reflect back on, remember when God showed up? Remember when we had a front row seat to watch God do the miraculous. Remember when God delivered us? Remember when God showed up? We could testify and tell those stories of deliverance over and over and over. So church, I'm calling you, I'm calling all of us to live by by this faith-filled plan that Moses gives us, that we would fear not because we have a God who's got us in his grip, that we would stand firm on his promises and his strength and his power, and that we would eagerly want to live by faith, be people that are anticipating and exciting, excited to watch God move. Let's be people that serve a God who did the Passover miracle, who did the Red Sea miracle, who did the manna from heaven miracle, who did the water from a rock miracle, who did the Easter Sunday resurrection miracle, who did the Pentecost miracle, and will do the miracle of bringing you and I all safely home to worship with him forever. Church, we love you, and I'll just say we are so thankful for each and every one of you out there. And if there are ways that we can pray for you, there's nothing more we'd want to do. And we can't wait to be 
in community with you here really soon. But in the meantime, let's be people who give all of our lives, just push all of our chips into the table of saying, let's be people who live by faith. Would you pray with me? God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are watching or listening to my voice right now, who don't want to fall into the cycle of fear and sarcasm and catastrophizing worst case scenarios but who are choosing to live by faith, even when that seems so hard, even when all the circumstances tell them that faith and hope are foolish, they are going to cling to you. So God, help us to get on the the fear not plan. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, through a, 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 a spirit inside each and every one of us, that we would take our thoughts captive and we would preach to ourselves the promises of you, Jesus, that we'd remind ourselves of your character? God, would all of us, would you help us change our thinking so that we can start writing with a a pen of faith rather than a, a pen of fear, thinking about all the bad things that can happen? And we believe that you're for us and we know you're not against us. Lord, we know that you love us. We know that you are for us and we know that you are good. We give all of our lives to you in your name. Amen. Church, why don't you sing this out with us? What a wonderful thing you are doing And it's marvelous in our eyes By your power and love you are moving And it's marvelous in our eyes Sing it out. What a wonderful thing Stonegate, it has been such a joy to worship the risen Jesus with you today. And we're going to keep worshiping now by taking an offering. And so if you are new with us today, feel no obligation to jump into this moment. Uh, We want to serve you. And if if you would help us by texting Stonegate Church, all one word, to 97,000, that would help us know how we can pray for you, how we can help get you connected. So if you would do that, that would be great. And as I pray, there should be a screen come up that will show you the various ways that you can give. So pray with me. Father, would you make us a joyfully generous people? 
Would you make us a people who reflect your heart in that way? We have never encountered a being more generous than you, O oh God, willing to give your own beloved son. And Father, I pray that we could reciprocate that generosity into the world. God, that you would make us an open-handed, tender-hearted people ready to see needs and step into needs. So God, would you please make our church family that generous, open-hearted, tender-hearted. And it's in the great name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So Stonegate, if you want to stand there where you are, this is the point in our service where we get to do our benediction. So our benediction today is coming out of Numbers chapter 6. And here's what the scriptures say. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Stonegate, blessings to you. We'll see you soon.